And so today we're going to be talking about spring and summer vegetables. We're right at the time of the season where we're kind of thinking about um, the coming of spring. And hang on, I got to answer this prompt. Got it. Um, and so we're going to be talking about um, issues related to spring and summer gardening and with the goal of sort of helping you be successful, whether you are new to this, uh, this season of gardening or whether you are a seasoned veteran. And so hopefully there'll be something you can take away. Um, and if nothing else, we get to spend a little time on a Saturday talking about gardening, right? So, um, so thanks for joining us. I will say that um, throughout the presentation, I, I mentioned this, the Foothill Vegetable Planting Guide. And so uh, I have mine here, my old school one, which is uh, battle-worn and wrinkled. And uh, it is sort of the definitive planning tool for um, gardening in the foothills. If you live, and, and, it, uh, and it has a way you can, um, so what it does, if you see on the screen to the left there, we're looking at January, February. Um, because that's when that's where we are now, and so now's the time to seed certain plants. So you see those little seed um, indicators, and then when you'll get plants, and when you can expect to harvest. And so um, it really is a great way to think about. Because um, really, we talk about spring and summer, but there's sort of two little micro seasons, and maybe some other ones inside there. So anyway, there is a link uh, that will be going into the chat. You can get this uh, on the MG website, and I think it's six bucks. They'll send it to you. The flip side is the the other season and the kind of stuff we talk about in the fall and winter gardening class in August. And it is, uh, there's a, like a little way you can figure out if you live sort of higher than Placerville or lower than Placerville, how you, um, cause the, the, the planting timing slips a little bit by a couple of weeks in one direction or the other. If you're, um, if you're lower, you can plant earlier, right? Cause it's going to be warmer sooner. So anyway, um, a really great resource. If you don't have one, you should pick one up. I think you'll really get a lot of benefit out of it. So today we're going to be talking about the stuff we're kind of seeding now in January and February, which is things like broccoli, cauliflower, um, cabbage, and lettuce, and um, then kind of all the full summer vegetables that we're kind of seeding now in greenhouses, typically <clears throat> like tomatoes and peppers and those kinds of things, and then some stuff that um, is most appropriately put directly into the ground, things like corn, um, cucumber, and other stuff. So. And I'm assuming, I didn't even actually check. I'm assuming everyone can hear me. <laughs> Someone give me a thumbs up. I can hear you just fine. Right on, thank you. So, um, so how does your garden grow? I, when we do these classes in person, I really, I, I'd like to start by kind of having you stop and think, um, how does your garden grow? How did it grow last year? Um, did you have something that was very successful? Did you have trouble in a particular way? If you want to drop some of those in the chat, that'd be nice. So your fellow passengers can um, get inspired or uh, might trigger some uh, memories. My garden, um, I've been really busy the last couple, a little bit. And right, so winter's a time when the garden kind of goes uh, quiet. But I went out this morning um, to have a look at what was going on. This is this morning. It's very cold uh, in, here in Georgetown. And there's frost on the ground. and my garlic, which is planted uh, in El Dorado County in October, typically. Um, and it's sort of over winters and then comes raging forth in the spring. It's doing great. It's a little slow this year. It, it took it a long time to, to pop up. Um, but that's my garlic this year, and it's in a raised bed. And then I went out to look um, at, this is a Japanese plum, um, the typical Japanese uh, pickling plum. Prunus something, if someone knows what or can remember what that is, um, put it in the chat. Um, and it is, it, is, it, is not gonna, it is not gonna be successful in my garden, I am predicting, because this is the second, I think it's the second or third year in, and it just um, buds too early. <laughs> it is on Japan time and not uh, El Dorado County time. So I'll keep it in the garden anyway and, um, uh, and it will just be a, but I doubt it will ever produce fruit because I think it'll always bud at around this time and the buds will get spoiled by the cold. So just a little bit about where and how I garden. This is my garden from the air. Um, and um, 
I have kind of four annual beds, uh, raised beds that I garden in. Those are the rectangles in the center of the screen. And then a lot of um, perennials and other stuff all throughout this part of the garden. And, and this kind of extends, this is kind of all I could get in, in that aerial image. But um, so I have tremendous investment in, um, in perennial crops uh, and fruit trees. And, and I am all about kind of unusual or rare and unusual vegetables and fruit. So I'm growing aronia and Chinese hackberry and Japanese plums and Chinese haw and um, medlar and, and tea. Um, what is tea? Camellia sinensis and myrtle and other things. And then those four beds in the middle are what I rotate through with my annual crops for spring and summer and fall and winter. So I want you also to think for a minute why it is that you garden. Um, and again, if you want to throw something in the chat, the reasons that you um, the reasons that you garden, um, and I'll share some of mine. So go ahead and either think about that or put some in the chat. And as I mentioned, this is a, anyone recognize this? This is a Chinese haw leaf. Chinese haw is a, um, a fruiting plant that makes an interesting, um, sort of like a little apple, which is um, candied and used in other, uh, in other ways. Um, I don't know if I can switch to the chat and see. Hopefully someone's put in a reason that they go. Um, these are what I, uh, these are all the things I planted over kind of the first COVID wave in my garden. So cornelian cherry, which is cornus moss, which is um, dogwood, and uh, crab apples and gummies and um, hardy kiwis, which are the little ones that aren't fuzzy. Um, and a loquat, which is doing really well. Um, I grew up in Southern California and loquats are something we, um, there are a lot of trees down there. They have that big slimy seed in the middle and they're, but they're, they're, the fruit is very tropical. And mountain ash and pawpaw, um, see buckthorn and seosin mulberry, which is actually a, also called water hemp, but makes a little um, tiny fruit. So anyway, um, the reason, one of the reasons that I garden is uh, to get things to, you know, as an experimentalist, um, there's that uh, water hemp. It makes these little, um, they're supposed to be tropical flavored. Um, they taste vague to me, at least the first year they fruited, which was last year. Um, but they grow interestingly on stems directly. I don't know if you can see in that photo, but directly in, from little stems uh, that come off the main stem rather than um, uh, off the ends of the branches. Zach, the folks in chat are saying they are gardening because they um, enjoy the fresh vegetables, the joy of gardening, and it's a fun activity. Nice. Thanks, folks. Yeah, and that's certainly um, that's certainly what we hear when we talk to gardeners and probably um, uh, that some of those ring true for you, even if you didn't put them in the chat. And they all ring true for me. Um, last year, I was able to, to get uh, I guess that was two years ago, crocus, uh, sativa, saffron crocus. Um, and I had a great harvest and I made saffron rice for Thanksgiving. This is a, a thing that blooms in the fall. And then over the intervening year, gophers ate them all, um, which is kind of a drag because they're, they're a beautiful plant. They smell incredible. And the bees climb in there and they kind of get um, drunk, so to speak. So you get the big, um, those big furry bees get in there and they just sort of hang out in there um meditating or whatever uh but i guess this is like the most uh, expensive plant per something or whatever because it's so you get three of those um little threads per flower and um, anyway uh oka there's oka oxalis tuberosa which is a andean uh, vegetable sort of potato-esque Alpine strawberries, uh, something I put in recently. And if you haven't had alpine strawberries, they make regular strawberries taste like um, convenience store garbage snacks. Alpine strawberries are just, the flavor is just incredible. Um, so I encourage you, and they're very hearty like, like strawberries are. And so I encourage you to pick some up if you can. And I put in Myrtis uh, communist true myrtle, which is the uh, botanical flavoring of the of myrt. Uh, Mirto, which is uh, a friend of mine, went to Sardinia, I think it's Sardinia, and uh, brought me back some Mirto. And it's a one of these like 
strange herbal liqueurs that um, is, is flavored with um, myrtle. And I'm growing, I've been growing uh, for years, I've been, had a project, a food forest project, um, integrating plants into uh, existing forestry on my uh, property at Georgetown. Um, this is a California native plot with things like Oregon grape, which is native to California and um, Sierra currants and holly leaf cherries and um, choke cherries and wild strawberries. Um, the idea here is that you are um, exploiting an eight layer canopy. So you have trees and small trees and shrubs and herbs and the root layer and the soil surface, ground covers and things that climb. So uh, long-term project. Um, and then someone probably mentioned, or you might've thought of the freshness of vegetables, right? One of the best reasons to garden is that you have, you can reduce the field to fork time. I encourage you every year I go out one day and I pick um, in both seasons, I pick everything I can get right then and try to make a meal out of it. Kind of like a Michael Pollan uh, omnivores dilemma thing in the last chapter of that book. Um, so this was a, this would be an early spring uh, harvest of asparagus and sorrel and uh, some herbs. And there are some, what look to be Chinese, uh, some mustards in there. Um, I also grow to share, right? So this is a picture from the UC Botanical, uh, UB, University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC, Canada. And uh, they have a beautiful garden there and they um, produce produce and share it with uh, folks that uh, need it. And we do that in this county. You can find information about Plant a Row on the Master Gardener website. So uh, I'm gonna trust you on this. I need everyone to close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to imagine your garden, your spring and summer garden in the height of harvest season. So mid to late summer, let's say. And I want you to imagine it in, in its full glory, uh, green and verdant and full of uh, fruits and vegetables that you can um, pick. And I want you to hold that image in your mind for a sec. And so that's what we're here to do, right? We're here to kind of talk about that and provide you with some tools and ways to think about gardening that will help you be as successful as you just imagined. Here's that, um, here is that effort that I do with like, this is all in, go out to the garden, grab as much as you can. So at that time, this was more like a summer harvest. I've got shallots and herbs, tomatoes and peppers, um, Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes. There's some raspberries there. Um, there's some blueberries. So this wouldn't be too late in the summer, but pretty early and some grapes as well. Um, and some beans. And so, you know, this became a, a, a nice, skillet stir fry with a fruit compote on the back end. So, so here's just a, a run of show for today. We're gonna talk about some gardening topics to help you be successful, how to plan and manage. Um, and then we're going to kind of talk about the spring vegetables, which are the first kind of the first chunk of, uh, first chunk of vegetables on our chart. So broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, lettuce, and their allies, and then move into um, the things that we think of when we think of summer vegetables, which are, you know, most people I think think of corn and tomatoes and uh, peppers and those kinds of things that kind of like the heat. We're gonna skip over perennials. I'll just mention that, um, and we'll talk about them in fall and winter because we don't wanna, we don't wanna be here too long. Um, so we'll go for a little bit. We'll take a break about an hour in, 10 minutes. We'll come back, finish up, and then have a Q and A. Um, so you can hold your questions, you can put them in the chat, um, you can make a note of them, and then we'll try and stick around and, and answer those uh, ones that we can and point you to resources um, that will help you um, when we part ways today. Master Gardeners have a ton of resources um, and a ton of expertise, and it's just a great organization. Um, so just so much like the, the amount, I'd love for someone to quantify the amount of expertise um, either in you know human years or in whatever else uh, that exists in the organization. Folks know and are enthusiastic about all sorts of topics um, in gardening. Outcomes. In my day job, I, I probably should have said, I don't think I think I skipped right over and just started. My name is Zach Dowell and I work at Folsom Lake College. I'm on the faculty there and I run the Innovation Center, which is a discipline agnostic general education hub for instructional innovation and comprehensive makerspace. And so a big part of my job is um, interdisciplinary innovation, um, working with fellow faculty to create opportunities for students 
um, for experiential learning, for hands-on learning, to get out in the field, to um, get their hands dirty. So that's what I do in my day job. And in my day job, we talk in terms of outcomes, which is what we hope uh, you do feel, believe, and after this experience, because of this experience, that's the definition of an instructional outcome. So I hope you plant or expand a vegetable garden. And you're probably planning to do that anyway, but I hope that if you were on the fence that you uh, you're going to just do it. I hope that you grow healthy, nutritious vegetables, and we'll talk about how you kind of get there. We, the Master Gardeners, hope you adopt IPM, Integrated Pest Management Strategies, and move beyond, uh, let's spray a bunch of poison on our garden, but let's, let's think about it in different ways, and how can we think about the garden as a system? I hope you share your surplus. I hope you're so successful um, that you um, share the love of gardening, either through Plant a Row or with neighbors. Um, and yeah, and develop strategies, but that, that actually is a slide from a, a master gardener training thing. I hope you do that too. I hope you get so good at gardening that you um, you share your knowledge with your neighbors. And my clicker stopped working. So when we talk about garden planning and management, we're talking about um, location and timing, soils and fertilizers, irrigation, and and seeding thing. Um, we, the master gardeners have classes almost in every one of these things, not, not location and timing so much, but soils and fertilizer irrigation, right? So I encourage you to look at the master gardener schedule. And um, so we're gonna touch on these things, but if you want the deep dive, then you're, you're gonna want to go to uh, the other classes uh, taught by experts in these particular um, aspects of gardening, but we will touch on them here briefly to get you started. So location is a big and important aspect in gardening. This is my garden. Uh, I garden in Georgetown, upcountry Georgetown specifically, at right around 3,000 feet, um, in the midst of a classic Georgetown sort of forest, a clear cut, um, surrounded by cedars and madrones and live oaks and um, those kinds of plants. Perhaps you're in a similar location and perhaps not. Um, Location is important because for a, a lot of reasons, but not the least of which is uh, sun, right? And especially for spring and summer vegetables, they like sun. Um, and so you're going to want to think about siting a garden or expanding a garden into areas that can get uh, pretty good sun. Um, pretty good uh, is six to eight. Um, and hopefully you've got that. I, again, all of this, I should say, your mileage may vary in all of this, and I wouldn't let any of these things stop you from trying. A big part of my day job is has to do with being okay with um, quote unquote failure, right? And so a big approach to the gardening that I think is really valuable is try something. Um, and if it doesn't work, make a note of it and then try something else, right? And so if you walk away with anything at all from today, I hope that that's the message. Just go out and try it. We're not, uh, this isn't, this largely isn't, um, rocket science and it is largely trial and error and so hopefully you have six to eight hours of sun you have a level an area that's level that that really is when you're water you know when you're watering you don't want the soil to be sort of moving <laughs> down a slope um that you have access to water in this county you need access to water we can't uh, we do not have wet summers and so um, you're going to need to be able to irrigate plants throughout the the hottest parts of the season I'm thinking about microclimates like areas in your garden that um, are cooler or cold sinks, right? If they have a lower, if they have a dip, the cold air might settle there, or you might have uh, areas of moving shadow. Uh, as in this photo, you can see that down there by the truck is the shadow of a, a large oak. Um, and so you can actually exploit those shadows. A lot of things like peppers really like to be, have some shade in the afternoon. Um, they're not as sort of ruggedly heat loving as some other plants. So those are things that you can kind of um, use to your advantage. And a garden that is accessible, meaning you can get to it, you can reach things, um, is going to be a successful garden because gardening in this county, I don't know if it is anywhere in the world, but it's not a set it and forget it kind of endeavor. <laughs> you've got you to gotta keep up with it, look at it. Um, and that we'll talk a little bit more about that during the IPM portion. So uh, this is a chart showing the, the um, USDA Department of Agriculture. 
um, the zones, right? So you may have heard of zones and and this has to do with what plants will be successful. Placerville is sort of dead center 9A. And as you go to the right or to the east, you're sort of heading up into this uh, into the colder areas. And if you're heading to the west, you're going um, farther down into areas um, that are slightly warmer, right? And this has to do with um, when you can plant. You might be able to plant a couple of weeks earlier um, if you live down in El Dorado Hills versus um, if you live up in Camino or Apple Hill or something like that. So um, we are also in the, and you'll see these on plants, especially perennials. And you might see another, there's another coding system called the, well, the Sunset Western Garden, um, which is a big California, you know, um, magazine and, and gardening books. And we are, uh, interesting fact, we're in the same, El Dorado County is in um, the same zone as Oregon's Rogue River Valley. And if you've ever been to the Rogue River Valley in Oregon, it looks exactly to me like Georgetown. It's all the same trees. It's very familiar. Um, and so these zones have to do with sort of when the last frost is, what the average coldest date is and those kinds of things. I wouldn't stress too much about it, but you should know it exists so that when you look at a plant and it says it, it will only work in, or it, it works best in these zones that you might be, um, you might have a, a thing that you can research. In summer and spring gardening, we want to go maximum yield in minimum space. That just makes sense. If you're going to do this, you want to get a bunch of food out, right? And so um, there are techniques to do that uh, in summer gardening in particular is going up, right? So this is my garden and there are trellises in various places. Um, so you can grow lots of plants, cucumbers, tomatoes. You can kind of train them up, uh, melons, and that and thereby kind of plant more in the same amount of space because they're up they're off the ground they're getting air circulation they're getting sun so we'll talk a little bit about that in particular varieties of plants and then a lot of this you'll see a lot of my pictures i happen to be blessed with like 2700 square feet of of um garden both perennial and and annual but you don't need that to garden right here's a little kitchen garden in a retired weber kettle um, filled with wonderful herbs and right outside the door for uh, fresh eating in the kitchen. So don't don't think that you need a, uh, acres and acres of space. <clears throat> don't think that you can't garden on a patio uh, or in containers of various kinds because you absolutely can. We'll, we'll kind of mention specific examples of plants that will work really well in those environments. That's kind of about uh, uh, the placement of your garden. And Hopefully you know what, what your garden looks, where the sun lies in the place you're planning to plant in different parts of the season. Where we happen to be in the world, the light is very different in the winter and the summer. It's very uh, slanted in the, in the winter. And so things, my garden is almost in full shade 100% of the time throughout the winter. And then in the summer and spring, it, it gets sun. So uh, again, if you don't know that, or if you've just moved here, or you've just moved to a new place, just put the garden in anyway. Try and guess. and um, and and be surprised. <laughs> Timing is a critical issue, especially in um, spring and summer gardening. Um, I mentioned this over and over again, but I'll just mention it one more time. This is an invaluable research source, um, and it was really tweaked and adapted by um, master gardeners in this county, Carolyn Stromberg in particular, um, and perhaps some other folks. Um, so you got to get this, get it. It's great. Um, and, and it's important if you want to be successful in gardening, if you plant things when it's too cold or when it's too hot, you know, they might not germinate, they might not grow in the way that you expect them to. And so just knowing the timing, you know, corn is not a winter plant, so we don't plant that there at the very basic level. Um, and then you'll find as you get deeper and deeper and deeper into this rabbit hole of gardening that there are, um, like you see the period even on this chart, that there's sort of, you're doing seeding all the way from, from January all the way through, um, july right and then there are there are things we see at the end of summer and then there's a, a really nice window in october that we do some particular planting and so um this chart will help you get into that and then the other thing that'll help you understanding timing is just sort of experience this is you know recognize this this is rhubarb and rhubarb is one of the two plants that i look for in the garden that let me know that spring is here right rhubarb pops up Asparagus pops up a little before rhubarb um, in my garden and then rhubarb. So if I go out there today, I actually looked at the asparagus to see uh, if it was starting to poke up. It's not. Um, 
but I expect it to in, you know, not too long, maybe another many weeks, but um, who knows anymore. But <laughs> having experience just being in your garden and observing and watching what's happening. Um, garden planning also to do is with um, a little bit of record keeping, right? Keep a little journal or take a lot of pictures or jot some things down on a piece of paper. When you're planting, say, rows, if you plant in rows, and some people do, I used to, I mostly plant um, annuals in beds now, um, which might have rows and might be other arrangements, but knowing what the plant looks like and acts like um, will help you to kind of be successful in, in citing things. In this particular example, which is a more like a fall and winter garden or an early, early spring garden, um, I got asparagus out on the right, right? Asparagus is a perennial. And so you don't want to be digging, you don't want to sort of put asparagus in amongst everything else because you'll be disturbing its roots. And asparagus can, you know, be around for 15 or 20 years. So you just want to put that out at the edge of the garden, but also realize that asparagus in its full glory in, is, you know, six feet high or eight feet high. Um, and so you can, if that's a, in a place where you can use that afternoon shade, for example, that's a good thing. If it's going to shade other things out, that might be a different thing. And so just kind of jotting some notes down, trying to plan things that have similar and group things that have similar water uh, requirements that have similar harvest times um, and, and finally rotating things. That um, crop is a kind of fancy word here, but rotation just means that you don't wanna plant the same thing in the same place every year, all the time. Um, there are some reasons for that. Um, pests and disease pressures can build up in that in that particular place, but also plants like what they like, right? So if you plant something that is a nitrogen hog in the same place and you're just sucking all the nitrogen out of that chunk of garden, it's eventually your yields are gonna go down, your plants are gonna be less happy. So it's a, a good idea to rotate. It's a good idea to follow crops. Um, classic examples of that are following corn with beans, which uh, corn is a heavy feeder, beans are a, nit a leguminous nitrogen fixer. So um, just, you know, make some notes and, and then compare notes with the previous season and see what worked and what didn't and try and figure out why. Talk a little bit, very little bit about soils and fertilizers. Um, plants generally like uh, neutral to slightly acid soil somewhere in there. Um, most gardeners, if they're just starting, get a soil test kit and do that. I did that, um, got really into it. Um, I backed off of that. I haven't tested my soil in 25 years or something, but um, because, uh, and I'll maybe harp on this a, a little bit, uh, you really should think of your soil as a as an organism or as a thing that you need to also build, right? Um, and we'll, we'll get into that. Plants require a very, they require a lot of things, but the kind of fertilizer uh, things that they require, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So if you look at a fertilizer bag or a box or liquid, you'll see these NPK numbers that always be three numbers. They generally, this is a general way to think about it. Um, nitrogen is about green growth and leaves. Phosphorus is about roots and potassium is about blossoms, right? Um, shoots, fruits and fruits is one way to think of that. Um, and a term you might hear is balanced. A balanced fertilizer is something that just has uh, sort of an even distribution of those three things, shoots, roots, and fruits. This is an organic liquid fertilizer, all purpose, low nitrogen, relatively low nitrogen, a 333. So that would be a balanced general purpose fertilizer. So if you just want to fertilize and you're not particularly trying to, if you're not worried about lots of leafy green growth or, you, or you're trying to tweak a plant into putting out more fruit, you might just give a general purpose fertilizer which you, you know, there's lots of ways to do fertilizer. Um, uh, I'm an organic gardener, so all of my choices are gonna be organic stuff. Um, you can mix it up in buckets, you can mix it up in giant bins, uh, or I guess that's also a bucket. What do you call it? Um, drum, drum. It's like a 50 gallon drum that I would mix up a bunch of um, kelp, kelp fertilizer or guano or one of these um, liquid organics, and then distribute those out in various ways. I mentioned your soil as an organism or as a, a thing that you're also building and compost is the way to, the, really the way to do that. Compost is a, um, and we have classes and real experts in compost and worm compost and, and vermiculture and stuff um, in El Dorado County. So look for courses that are specifically about how to be successful with composting. But at the very, um, 
at the very least, you can kind of sit out in an area and throw vegetable scraps in it. And uh, and depending on where you are, the foxes or the um, raccoons or you know whoever will turn that up for you, and um, eventually it'll turn back into soil um, as it rots down. Uh, if you have access to animal manures, this is a big pile of horse um, that I a neighbor had given me. Um, you can you can do that. And there again, you'll want to take these. You want to go to the class about composting and stuff because what you don't want to do generally is throw a bunch of fresh horse manure on your garden there might be some salt issues with that it might be too hot from a nitrogen perspective the way i do it is i pile up manure and when there's worms in it and it has weeds on it it's probably ready that's the easy rule of thumb because then things seem to be growing in there and the worms aren't bothered by it so um, there are more scientific ways but that's a pretty empirical way to figure out what's happening if you have little animals like rabbits, rabbit manure is like one of the best manures in the world. And then you get these feedback loops where you can give them uh, carrots. Because you're always, when you grow carrots, right, they take so long that you always want to see, are they ready? And you, and so you pull a few up, feed them the rabbit, rabbit turns them into manure for you, and the cycle continues. If you got access to barnyard animals like ducks, they're great at turning compost. They root around in there for bugs and little things and fertilize while they're doing it. Um, and cover cropping. So um, cover cropping is a technique where you plant specific things that you're going to let grow and then chop up until into the soil. And they typically consist of uh, some grasses, so uh, oats and rye, and some leguminous things like vetch and bell beans and field peas. And you can buy these as mixes. <clears throat> I use one that's uh, just sort of identified as a generalist soil builder mix. And I typically plant mine in October with the hope that it will get some, you know, it used to, it used to rain on October 31st, by October 31st, where I live every year. That's not been true. It's been inconsistent the last 20 years, but um, I still try and plan that for October. Like the goal is get this in the ground, get it germinated with that last bit of um, warmth and sun. Um, and get it sort of started by November and then it grows up all winter. <clears throat> I'm going to duck the mic and clear my throat. Pardon me. Okay. And so legumes have this great thing that they do, these little nodules. Um, um, there are these um, relationships of nitrifying bacteria and stuff that live in the roots of these plants and um, take grab nitrogen from the air and turn it into plant available things, which can then break down and feed plants. So beans are in this family, peas are in this family. Um, lots of interesting native, uh, uh, bear clover, kikidizzi is a, a non-leguminous um, native plant here. And then bad plants do this too, like um, scotch broom. But in a soil builder mix, in a, it, you're gonna have some, some bell beans and field peas and, and veg. So you let it grow um up through the you let it grow and then it is very these are hardy plants right they'll sit under snow this is my raised beds cover uh cover crop raised beds sitting under a blanket of snow as soon as that snow melts the plants will spring back up as soon as it gets even the slightest bit of early spring warmth they'll just shoot right up to you know knee or waist height you get a kid to go out there um and chop it up and you till it into the soil and then you wait about two weeks. <clears throat> and that's just adding, you know, roughage basically and nitrogen to your soil and you're loosening up your soil and you're incorporating organic material and all those are good things. Um, you can do this at sort of this kind of scale where you're doing it in, in big plots. You can do it at raised bed scale. Um, the way I do it in raised beds is then I get a, uh, I get a, uh, whatever that thing is, a hedge trimmer. Is that what that's called? It has a little teeth that go ch -ch 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 -ch. Um, and chop that up and throw it. I throw it in a, a bin and then use a string trimmer to chop it up into little bits and then till that back into those beds. And you just want to wait, um, you know, more or less two weeks for that to break down. You don't want to plant right into that because there's a there's a spike in um, as, as the soil organisms are trying to break that material down. They're using up all the nitrogen in the environment. So you have this nitrogen dip initially and then it sort of levels back out. Um, so anyway, just plant it till that stuff in, wait two weeks, and then you should be good to go um, planting into that bed. And you've added a bunch of material that's going to just help continue to keep the soil 
healthy and um, and not depleted. Um, and then, yeah, I'm in be raised beds now because um, my garden is at the is in a clear cut, surrounded by forest, and you can imagine that all the trees in the local neighborhood thought that what a great uh, what a great place, loose soil. Um, fertilizer, water, and so I was seeing declining yields when I had plants of uh, annuals in particular in the ground, and it was because the, my garden eventually became just a mass of solid roots from all the trees, and so I tried this technique of double digging, which is you like sort of dig a big trench and you till at the bottom of that, and then you you do one right next to it, throw that soil on top, and you're kind of really trying to break the soil up um, at a deep level, and the trees just you know filled it up with roots again so i have raised beds now and i actually have a membrane under them um to keep the because the roots will like find their way up into raised beds if you don't kind of separate them from the the ground um and even then if they if one gets in it'll multiply and then you have to kind of dig out the raised bed so if you are seeing declining yields in your raised beds you might want to check to see if they're all rooted and matted out if you're in a situation like i am the general rule there, though, is just feed your soil, not your plants. It's better to have rich organic soil that you just think about. What are you going to do for the soil every season? And that might be letting, letting it rest. Like, OK, this plot looks like it's a little played out. We're going to let that rest or we're going to cover crop it or we're going to bring in some compost or we're going to, um, you know, plant a less um, heavy feeder or whatever. But just really start thinking about your soil. And that goes back to planting too, right? If you have a couple of places you plant, you probably want to have a little map and say, oh, right, last year I had corn here. I'm going to do peas there. I'm going to cover crop this. And as you get into multi-season gardening, that planning will help you also decide what you can do. Um, when will that plot or that area be ready for the next thing? So let's move on really quickly to um, irrigation, which is the fancy word for watering. This is a monstrosity of a DIY manifold that you'll find throughout my garden. Um, um, so here we have a, and actually last year, I uh, when the soil was still moist, I, I actually plumbed my whole garden, um, which was a huge accomplishment. I've been gardening there for like 20 years with just laying hoses on the ground and just having these kind of janky, um, uh, well, they're beautiful, Never mind janky. It's a beautiful manifold, DIY manifold that has a supply hose on the bottom and a bunch of um, splitters and um, uh, timers and overhead watering and stuff. The the gist generally about watering is that um, the punchline is drips the best way to do it for a lot of reasons. Um, in particular, it's it's the most water conscious. It allows you to really tailor your watering system. It's not anything like as complicated as it was even uh, 20 years ago when I started gardening. Drips are like actually pretty easy now. Once you get kind of the basic gist, we have a class, I'm not sure where it is on the schedule, what we have in the past have had an irrigation class where you can get hands on. They bring out all the bits and bobs and the things you connect and, and they can talk you through how to figure that out, but it's just not that hard anymore. And you just need like sort of a pressure reducer and then, um, you know, a little bit, a couple of custom tools that are a beautiful pinky purple color, whatever, I'm sure you've seen them. And um, so drip is the best way to water. Uh, of course, lots of us love hand, like soul gardeners love to hand water, and I do a bunch of that, and you probably do too. Um, uh, overhead water makes sense in certain certain instances. Um, but really, watering is also not just about adding water, but what how what is your soil's capacity to hold water? And what are you doing to keep um, evaporation from happening? Um, so you do that by having rich organic soils that you're working either compost into or uh, cover cropping and then using mulches, organic mulches to kind of shade the top. You know, you lay that on thick at the top of the soil, keeps the water from uh, evaporating, makes the plants roots happy, cools the soil um, higher up towards the surface, which encourages the worms to come up, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's not just a question of water. It's a question of uh, thinking about your soil and, and mulch and those kinds of things. Talk about seeds. Seeding is the, the best plants from seeds, it's the best way to, or the cheapest way certainly to get a bunch of different vegetables. And it's the only way to get um, certain kinds of vegetables. That said, you should, don't beat yourself up if you don't have time to seed <laughs> vegetables. 
You can certainly buy them in six packs. You can come to the Master Gardener plant sale, which I uh, believe is April 15th. Um, I have a slide about it, so don't write that date down now until I confirm it or someone confirm it in the chat. You're uh, correct, Zach. It's April 15th for all edibles and two weeks later for everything else. Outstanding. And it really is a, it's a wonderful thing and it's grown into a, um, and I have a beautiful picture of the, the garden that it benefits um, towards the end here. But So that's a great way to get vegetables. Uh, if you have a seed library like we have at the college or um, in various libraries, I think even the Master Gardener um, office has one or had one, um, you can do that. But it's a way you can get other, you know, you'll be able to find whatever, 10 varieties of tomatoes at the average big, big box store or nursery. But there are hundreds and hundreds of varieties of tomatoes. So if you want to get a little experimental, um, you can, you can, you know, search the web for uh, seed companies and um, find all kinds of really interesting um, seeds that you can start. And when you're starting seeds, you're really, there's a couple of factors. Um, soil and soil here is actually a misnomer because you don't usually plant seeds into soil. You plant them into sort of soilless um, mixes, which are typically mixtures of moss and um, sand and peat and perlite and vermiculite and those kinds of things. Um, you can go to a store and buy a seed starting mix, right? Um, um, you don't typically plant it, you don't take some garden soil and put it in a six pack and then plant a bunch of seeds. The reason being there's fungi and um, there might be other pathogens that would um, be counter to um, the kinds of things that seeds like, which are really, they don't like to be soggy, most of them. They like to, to be in a light, um, fluffy mix with lots of good air circ circulation, especially once they have germinated. And they are typically pretty temperature dependent, meaning, um, um, well, it means they'll, they germinate when they think it's the right time to grow, right? And so you can cheat that. What we often do as gardeners is cheat that by doing that inside in a windowsill or in a greenhouse. We're basically um, warming the season up for them and getting things started so that by the time it's warm enough to plant them out, they, they are already you know, this high rather than sort of starting when they would ordinarily go. So. And there are some great um, local seed sources, which are plants that are really adapted for our parts of the, uh, our part of the world. Um, I'm not gonna go over this, but I, I like to, this is a seed experiment using 18 molar sulfuric acid to um, germinate um, elderberry. Elderberry seeds are meant to go through a bird, right? And get pitted in, um, in their crop and um, so they can be hard to germinate. So I did an interesting experiment. Um, but when you're uh, when you are when you're planting seeds, right? You're going to start in a greenhouse or in a, a warm area that has access to sun. Um, this is some. I start often in four inch pots, um, especially things that are bunchy like um, dill and hyssop here. And you see th these are kind of. I put a lot of seeds in there, so they're sort of made uh, intended to grow like a little bunch that I can plant out. Um, but also tomatoes because they're they are. Um, they can be big plants by the time you've seeded them and they're out, put out. If you have, this was an old jewelry case with a sliding glass door on top of it, which was one of my original greenhouses. Not a great one. It got up to whatever, 250 degrees in there. Not a great environment for plants, a little too hot. Um, I currently have a greenhouse um, that has a snow hat, so it doesn't get crushed um, in my garden. And that's, so that's where I start my seeds in every year. And I use a, a often use an, a, a seed starting mat, a warming mat, which is just a big kind of rubber mat that you can put under things that kind of keeps the soil temperature a little higher, so the seeds um, get good root growth when it's when it's pretty cold outside. You want to give them access to sun and air when you can, or light and air. So I I do this dance in early spring of like moving every day. I go into my greenhouse and I move the plants out to. Um, sun and kind of start to harden them off and then move them back in, especially if it's going to be super cold at night. Um, because what you don't want is really long leggy plants that like, especially tomatoes, right? You, you put tomatoes in soil and if they don't have enough light, they just start to stretch, right? And they're trying to get some light. They're trying to get all the light. And so you end up with sort of long, stretchy, weak um, seedlings. And what you want is stout, um, stout seedlings. And so the way you do that is to really make sure they have enough light. And you can do that with supplemental light sort of any kind of light. Um, for a long time, I did those, whatever those cheap shop lights that are that the, with the fluorescent tubes and stuff. Um, and, you know, put that right down against the, the tomatoes so that they are just getting a lot of light. 
Um, so different strategies for that, but just give them light, make sure they have air circulation. Otherwise you'll get damping off fungus, which I'm sure you've seen that on a seedling. It's like right at the soil level, they get pinched and um, they can fall over. And um, so good air circulation, good light and a lightweight soil mix. Pea pots are an option. I don't, they don't work great in my opinion. This is a pea pot. You can see all the roots um, are up above that, but they're, you know, try them. They work fine. Um, there are just better ways to do it, I think, but they're, they're a quick and easy way, right? You put those pea pots, you soak them, throw the thing in, good to go. Speedling trays are great. They're uh, just like sort of trays that have these conical, like four-sided pyramid um, wells, and they're more a commercial nursery thing. Oh, you can buy them in, in, at good nurseries. Um, they make a great uh, root ball, um, little plug, and are easy to plant. This is a uh, sorrel, French sorrel. Um, so that's some things about starting seeds. And again, there's tons of really great catalogs and other resources. Um, IPM, really quickly, integrated pest management. This has to do with preventing, right? The best, prevent, the best way to have healthy plants is to prevent the diseases and pests from happening, keeping your plants healthy, knowing what the actual problem is. Um, this is a common problem for almost all gardeners. And if I were, we were all in the room together, everyone would say aphids on cue. Um, and you know they're aphids because, well, you've seen aphids. They're typically under a plant. If you look at them with the your master gardener or hand lens, you'll see that they have these little cornicles, um, those little um, black spikes at the bottom. And you won't confuse them with it. So that's aphids. How do you deal with aphids? You wash them off with water, the end. Um, nothing stronger or spicier than that. Or you have damage like this, which is typically which is different than this, which is, so in the former case is um, caterpillars, cabbage moths, and in the latter case is goldfinches. Um, goldfinches, of course, you're not gonna do anything about. You let them eat a few leaves. Cabbage moths, you can do a couple of things. You can use BT or you can use row covers. Um, how do you deal with this? So row covers are lightweight material that you can lay over the rows to exclude stuff. Um, what we really are encouraging not to do is just throw a bunch of insecticide. Um, insecticides have their place, but you have to be very careful about um, reading the label and using them for what they're used for. And some of us choose not to use them at all um, because there are easier and sort of less environmental degradation through other mechanisms, like picking bugs off or spraying bugs off or just accepting minor damage. You know, uh, If your plant is healthy, if you've done all the things we just talked about and had good water and soil and timing and the right varieties, your plants can stand a little a little damage. And if you deal with it, they'll usually snap back. Uh, using BT or insecticidal soaps when you can, and if you, if you feel you must use chemicals, use them prudently. Just a quick story. This is bird netting over strawberries, which never I would never use again because it kills every, every snake and lizard in a thousand mile radius will get trapped in here like a drift net and stink and die and it's not good. And it doesn't keep, the actual culprit here out anyway, which is a little mustache rat that would gather up all the strawberries and take them to uh, their nest and, and eat them. Um, and then birds are a common problem. This is two layers of bird defense uh, on my blueberry patch. I found this slug in the garden and we're actually, I think we are in the range for the banana slug, believe it or not, um, but I've, I've only ever seen this one. Um, and deer is the one everyone ask, asked about. And there you'll see all kinds of folk remedies. The Master Gardeners are uh, a research-based organization, meaning, meaning we share UC vetted research about what actually works in gardening. And so you'll hear a million folk remedies, which may or may not work, right? But they are, uh, many are not sort of um, borne out by research or have not had um, official studies done on them. So you'll hear um, eggshells and hair and coyote urine and stuff. And some of that stuff may work, but really the only the only thing for deer is uh, fences, big fences. And even then, <laughs> deer are crafty. And you'll see, oh, deer, deer resistant plants. There are plants that deer like to eat, and then there are plants that deer will eat. And there's not really any category other than that. Deer, deer ate a bunch of walnut um, in my garden, and walnut is kind of notorious um, for being um, allelopathic and, and, and um, having a lot of kind of things in its in its roots and and leaves that will 
kill other plants, but dearly eat it just fine. And then um, the general gist of IPM is just like, think of your garden as a system, right? Um, I don't like seeing rattlesnakes in my garden, but I know what they're doing and they're eating the rodents that would otherwise damage my garden. I love seeing giant king snakes in my garden. Um, and I love seeing ladybugs and beneficial insects, uh, pollinators and um, uh, aggressive aphid eaters um, because they're doing the work. And um, and as long as you are out in your garden, Carolyn Stromberg, uh, may she rest in peace, who taught this class with me many, many years ago, um, would always say the best insecticide is the gardener's shadow. And so the degree to which you can be in your garden in the day, but also at night, go out in the garden with a flashlight and see what's going on um, is the degree that you can get ahead of these problems before they become like a giant infestation. If you see some spider mites um, starting to get into your bean, the lower bean leaves, then you're gonna pull the, um, the IPM website, or you're gonna call the master gardeners, or you're gonna use some of the resources we'll share, and you're gonna figure out how to solve that before it becomes a full-scale infestation. So. Because you want foxes in your garden eating meadow voles, and you want um, that's just a beautiful picture of a coyote from uh, Temecula. Um, so we're going to go into the early spring vegetables, and then we're going to take a break, and then we're going to talk about the full summer vegetables, and then we're going to do Q and A. Sound good? If you, it, it's funny, if I was teaching in person, I say if you need to get up and stretch, do that. And obviously, you're all in in your um, homes or places of business, so feel free to get up and stretch. I'm standing because I, I can't possibly sit down and do this for that long. So spring vegetables, this is the things on the chart that we're sort of seeding now um, and into, um, and again, I'm looking at my chart. Um, we're kind of seeding now and planting out in March-ish uh, or seeding now and kind of planting in April and May. And we can expect them to harvest in May or June for the for things like broccoli. Um, but we're also sort of seeding now for tomatoes and um, pretty soon for carrots and um, radishes and chard and um, eggplants and peppers and those kinds of things. So, so cruciferous vegetables are uh, um, named, so named because of the um, four petal cross shaped flower. This is sort of everything in the family like broccoli. This is actually a broccoli plant that has gone a little longer than you, know, you would buy it in the market or harvest it yourself. It's in flower. Um, these plants we're eating for, most of the full summer plants we're eating for their fruiting bodies, right? Um, so the things that bear seeds, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, right? We're eating the flesh around the seeds. For most of the early spring stuff, we're eating immature flowers or leaves. And that's true for fall and winter vegetables too. So the coal crops um, or cruciferous vegetables, they, and honestly, um, you may find as you, if you start to do these crops as an early spring crop, it, that you will have a lot of pests, uh, aphids and moths in particular. So you may choose to do these as a fall and winter crop at the end of the season when the aphid problems are, are less. But um, the goal with these is to get them into the ground and then you're harvesting before the heat of summer largely. So in, in uh, May and June. They like rich, deep soil, as most plants do. You want to look for ones if you're planting seeds that have um, short maturation, like time to um, uh, time to harvest. Um, uh, trick there is if you're if you, a lot of those are say early, they'll be like early girl or early something. That just usually means that there's a short time between when they seed and when they fruit or flower. Best time, honestly, is fall, at least in my garden. Um, although I will. Um, make an exception for mustards, leafy mustards, which I can plant almost any time. They got a lot of pests, that's the issue, right? Um, and they like fertilizer, right? Remember shoots, roots and fruits, um, shoots being the green growth. A lot of these things, especially if you're going them for leaves like mustards and cabbages, that's, they like a lot of nitrogen or they like it, at least sufficient nitrogen. And so one thing you can do is side dress, which means adding fertilizer sort of to the sides of the plants and scratching it in in a granular case or wetting the soil with a um, liquid fertilizer to make sure that they have enough to put out green growth and uh, those things. They're super hardy um, and can stand snow and frost and everything else. And in fact, a lot of things like cabbage and mustards and things are sweeter after a frost. So they're not, you don't have to worry too much about them succumbing to the elements regardless of when you plant them, except perhaps in a really hot uh, environment. 
Um, and I trend towards the, um, the leafy versions of these things, um, mustards, um, collard greens, and those kinds of things. Reason being, like if a plant's to be a plant, it probably has leaves. And so if the thing you want is leaves, you'll probably be successful. And if, if you're expecting a big market head of cauliflower or broccoli, you can do that, but it's a little, it's, it's a sort of a, a, a finer product, if you will, and, and the plant has to have the right conditions to kind of do that. No matter what, it's probably going to put out leaves, but will it flower? You know, probably if you do the right thing. And then choosing things like this is Calabrese or Calabrese um, is a broccoli that doesn't have like a giant central head. It has a, a good size one, but then has little florets at all the, the nodes and you can pick it over a longer period of time. Um, and there's the name of that one with triple, triple asterisks. What I talked about early, I meant this is this is pretty early. 60 to 110 days is kind of an early window for these things. So if you're planting from seed and it says matures in 60 to 110 days, you're probably good to do it as a early spring. More on the 60 side. Because again, these plants don't typically do well when it gets hot. They'll bolt like a lot of things and they'll start to stretch and think it's time to produce seeds. And that's not often what you want. Row covers, again, is a lightweight material that you can find at good nurseries um, that you cover the crop with and or cover the row with and it sort of excludes the flying insects then can't get um, to it these are beautiful this is actually i think the only photo in here that isn't from my garden but i think it's too beautiful not to share this is minaret um kind of a if you're into math it's a pretty neat fractal um, this is a broccoli uh, excuse me cauliflower from my garden and it it was about the size of a you know softball and i felt very satisfied with that um, and was very proud to have grown that. It doesn't grow really, it's harder to grow than broccoli for me. And all of those are harder to grow than collard greens or mustards. Um, so there's some collard greens or kale. That might be kale actually. Um, great plant to grow if you like it. Everyone likes to crispy kale and, and that kind of stuff these days. Um, that's tatsoi spoon mustard, a very mild mustard. Mustards come in, um, Kind of real spicy varieties then they come in really mellow varieties and this one is much more like a, a spinach it's kind of a softer it doesn't have a strong assertive flavor really good in a stir fry small plant um kohlrabi's in this family and it's fun to grow kohlrabi if you can um because it's one of the i'm just eating that that just peel that and eat it right out in the garden mm. if you like you know broccoli and those kinds of things the collards are a real good good thing to try it, um, because they're they're just pretty rugged and they can stand the heat a lot more than some of these other. I can see from this picture, this is uh, uh, collard greens standing right next to some scarlet runner beans. So this is a, a pretty late end of the season and that those collards look great to me. So, and then mustards, where, where I spend most of my time in this kind of group of families is uh, it, it, uh, vegetables is mustards which come in a variety of sizes and shapes and colors and a variety of sort of spiciness versus not. <clears throat> and can be nicely interplanted. So that's a red mustard on the right, um, right next to a chard uh, on the left. Looks like a Fort Hook giant. And actually some chard in the back that's uh, like a ruby chard or something. So you can interplant and mix these. A lot, it's fun sometimes to take a bunch of leafy stuff and just sort of get a handful of different varieties and sew it out and see what you get. <clears throat> yeah, just more mustard. I love mustard, if you couldn't tell. Um, and that's uh, actually called bald head mustard um, that I planted a couple of years back. Um, a variety you're not gonna find you know, in the stores, but um, something you can get seeds for that produces sort of a, a nice, um, uh, not carrot-like, but an, a nice kohlrabi-like thing at the bottom and then spicy mustard uh, tops. Uh, and then this is perennial kale or walking stick kale. That's about six feet long, those those um, those long stems there. Um, so you can look for perennial kales and they, they, they go year round. Um, they're a little tougher than some of your more tender kales, but they provide the same kind of nutrition and the same kind of uh, leaf. And then lettuce is another plant that we're planting in early spring. Lettuce likes, um, here's just a lot of beautiful lettuce. There's trout back in there and um, black seeded Simpson and red oak leaf and um, 
Lettuce is a little seed, and it, so you can scatter it in an area and kind of scratch it in. Um, <clears throat> and then you're going to want to thin that, right? So generally, think when we're talking about thinning, we're looking at what is the final shape of the plant, like the circumference, is that circumference or diameter, whatever. The, and you want the next plant to be sort of right next to it, but not too crowded. So you got to kind of think of, well, what is the lettuce is going to be like that? So the next one's going to start over here and be right next to it. So you want to thin for that. And you can eat all the things you thin in this case. So you just go out there and pull up the fresh lettuces and have like a microgreen salad and then let the, the ones, once you're spaced out, let those ones grow. And then you can do uh, cut and come again, harvesting on lettuce. You take, um, say, no more than a third from any one plant by just cutting the outer leaves, the older leaves. And then, you know, do that on every plant and leave the rest and it'll just keep putting out leaves and you can extend your harvest that way. You don't have to cut the whole thing out of the ground and put it in a bowl. Um, it's leaves, so it likes soil that has good nitrogen. Uh, lettuce has sort of shallow fibrous roots that are a lot on the surface, so it likes consistent watering. So keep the soil mo moist but not soggy and don't let it dry out too much. And then the problem, the chief problem with lettuce, I mean, other than insects that want to eat the leaves and um, white flies and stuff, is that it when it gets even a little bit of heat, uh, it will bolt, meaning it stretches out and throws a seed head and then it's bitter and awful. And so you really want to sneak your lettuce in in the early part of spring. So we're seeding lettuce um, because it's so quick. Um, is lettuce on here? I don't see it. You know, you can start it in six packs. You could probably start it now or through the end of February. You can scatter on the ground. The great thing about also lettuce is that if you throw it in the ground, it will germinate when it's ready, when it's time, right? So if, I, if you threw it out now, it'll be fine. And it might not germinate for another two weeks or something, but it knows when it wants to grow based on the environmental conditions. So that's a fun experiment too, especially if you're new to gardening, some of these things. Find a place out by a fence where you can just throw something in the ground and see when it decides that it's time to germinate. And then lettuce is um, sort of four kinds. There's loose head and loose leaf and romaine styles, which are the long with this kind of fleshy midrib and then crisp head, which you shouldn't grow in your garden. So uh, I go loose leaf. If you've never grown lettuce, start with loose leaf because there's so many um, varieties and those are just big sort of leafy plants. They don't make a head and they don't, um, they just make a, a plant. So red oak leaf is a classic one, black seeded Simpson and, um, and Thai green are three that I, um, can recommend. And then if you want to grow a romaine style, Paris Island Coast is the classic, um, the classic uh, Caesar salad lettuce. So you want to branch out in your lettuce. Let's talk a little bit about um, roots and then we'll take a break. Um, that's burdock. Anyone grow burdock? Burdock is a, um, a kind of a medicinal plant, but also a, a, a pretty good crunchy, nutty, earthy kind of plant. Um, I don't know, I was proud of that one. I think it grew pretty well. Uh, root crops, as you might imagine, the soil's important. They want to lose soil without a bunch of rocks in it because the part that you're interested in is growing down the air below the soil surface. So you want them to have room to move. Um, early planting here. So this we're in this planting window starting sort of now. The variety uh, is important. That's especially true for carrots, right? Um, and we'll talk specifically about carrots. Thinning again, you just don't want them crowding their neighbor. You want them to, to be like, here's the here's the thing, and the next one's right there, but it's not right there, <laughs> right? So you just want to thin them so they're, you can get guidance for that on the seed pack. It'll often say, although the seed pack, it, their interest is in selling you more seeds. So they often give a very, very wide spacing. <laughs> um, you can usually game that a little tighter than, um, uh, with experience than the seed packet would indicate. But if you're unsure, just use the, the guidance from the seed packet. Um, and, you know, pests of these insects will go to the tops and, and want to eat them and some kind of um, worms and things will go to the into the roots. Um, and because it's shoots, roots and fruits, phosphorus is an important thing, right? So um, this is not that you should necessarily add phosphorus, but if you're treating your soil as an organism and kind of getting a good um, organic um, compost moving in there, you'll probably be fine. And if you have problems, you might look to a phosphorus deficiency as a, um, as a possible solution. But carrots, what I mentioned, variety is important because you don't want the, the more, you'll be most successful with, with planting carrots that are supposed to be sort of six inches and below, um, until you get really into carrots and you want to grow them in sand beds and, you know, giant carrots, but uh, tapered short carrots, 
um, carrots take forever to germinate and, and show, but they're delicious. So here's just a little carrot chart. <laughs> And it uh, right there in the middle at sort of seven, six and a half, seven inches and below Nantes and Danver on up to little, you know, short carrots. Try there. And then if you want to try growing longer carrots, you just just know that you'll have to have a much deeper um, soil and and um, and probably a pretty long time. So that's just beautiful carrot foliage um, by the light of a solar eclipse. And then radishes. Um, um uh, great plant in the garden you can interplant radish and carrots just get a handful of radish seeds and carrot seeds and throw them in together the radishes will germinate almost immediately and make a radish and as you pull them up you're thinning the carrots um you can enter they don't like heat a lot so you can interplant them in shady spots in a summer garden um some are designed to have soft tops and you can eat them in salads um, and there's a radish and then you can get into kind of esoteric and unusual. This is dragon's tongue potting radish, which makes really nice pods that you can stir fry um, and doesn't actually make a rat. I mean, all radishes will do this if you let them go, but these are designed, or not designed, but selected specifically to have slushy pot. So I think I'm gonna pause there because I gotta get something to drink and we need to break. So let's meet back here in 10 minutes and we'll finish up. Perfect, enjoy your 10 minutes. We'll be back at uh, 10, 17. Thank you. And I saw some of the comments. So um, someone asked about mulch. I'll just briefly say I use pine needles um, uh, because I have them in abundance. And you'll hear a lot of things about pine needles as a mulch, like, oh, acid, this and that. But I don't ever till them in the soils. And you should never till woody, woody mulches into your soil. Typically, you sort of, I use them and then uh, move them off the soil for when I'm cover cropping and then put them in for the hot season and move them off. And there's very little breakdown at that soil surface and certainly not at, uh, of the pine needles I use. It takes season after season to really break those down. So they, they really do sit on the top of the soil and then I just move them off and pile them up for the next year. And then we had the, the whole tree thing come in. I have probably a lifetime supply. I got greedy, I think. And when they had the dump trucks of the chips, <laughs> I was like, I have I have an endless capacity to take chips. So I probably have what I think is a lifetime supply of um, woody chips um, from my property and the property surrounding here, which is a, which is nice because you're not, you know, introducing a bunch of um, pathogens or other weirdnesses from other areas. So <clears throat> anymore, I will probably be just mulching with the chips from the tree projects. And again, not tilling those into the soil at the end of the season, but just moving them into a pile getting the soil ready, planting, and then reapplying the mulch. So uh, potting radish, right? we were talking about radishes and that's just a fun one. But let's talk a little bit about onions. And so onions are fun to grow. Um, listen, onions, we are um, starting seeds or... Can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, Zoom is telling me that it's, you know, crashing or something, but if you can hear me, I'll proceed. Proceed, you sound great. Okay. Um, <laughs> never mind you, Zoom. Um, so salads and onions you can plant from seed, or you can plant from sets, or you can buy, um, you can buy them in six packs. They look like grass and you can use a water stream and a, and a whatever, a little fork and tease those apart into individual plants and plant them. They're actually super rugged, for surprisingly, for their size. Um, and we're doing that um, <clears throat> uh, seeds in March. I've tried sets, which means buying, you, know, you can buy bulbs and stuff. They don't really work for me in my garden. Um, so I, I start from seed or I start from six packs um, and tease them apart. And I mentioned um, take pictures of your garden. This is an example of not good plant spacing. Um, this is my onion thing. You can see that some of those are too close together, especially ones in the lower foreground. And then other ones are too far apart. And so um, I have since done a better job of separating onions. Onions come in a lot of varieties. There's stronger American ones, which are have that strong oniony flavor. There's milder European types, um, also in red, yellow, and white. They're a little bit less strong. They're a little bit sweeter. And then you can have bunching onions and multiplier potato onions and uh, Egyptian walking onions, which are fun to grow. Um, 
their top setting. So they grow up and then they have bulb bills on the top that get heavy at where they would have a flower cluster and those fall on the ground and root and that's why they walk. They sort of year after year, they're kind of moving along. Um, and you'll see a bunch of stuff about long day or indeterminate, or excuse me, intermediate. Um, generally speaking, the, the, the onion, onions are, are day length dependent, right? And so you'll see them in long day, short day, and intermediate day. And so um, you can try the long day ones in the spring or intermediate day ones in the fall. But generally where we are in California is mostly intermediate um, onions. So if you see that on a seed packet, um, that's what you're going to look for. And what that means is like, the, if, if you have the wrong kind of onions, here's two onions, one made a bulb and one didn't, and it just stretched and made a flower. And I just had the wrong kind of an onion that was not suited to my particular uh, latitude. And you can still use all those greens as, as green onions or in an onion soup or something. And so that's fine, but you did, you're not gonna get, if you um, pick the wrong ones, you might not get a nice big onion. And again, all you do there is you say, oh, I picked that one, it didn't work. Let me try a different one, right? You don't. Don't beat yourself up for it. Um, there's just another close-up of one that was on its way to bulbing and one that didn't. But again, you can use all those greens. And it's a neat family of plants. They, they make beautiful flowers and there's um, wild onions and there's shallots, which are uh, here pictured. And shallots are cool because you sort of plant, uh, depending on the variety, you plant one and then you get sort of um, five, so it's like a one to five, and they grow in the, this. This particular one grew in this neat star shape, um, branching out the way that garlic does, right? If you plant garlic, it kind of adds rings of garlic around the center. Um, and this is a bulb bill. This is for Kathy. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, Kathy, who is a master gardener. May she rest in peace. And this is um, bulb bills, which are little cool. Uh, I talked about Egyptian walking onions. They are little cool onions or shallots that grow at the top uh, of the flower cluster. And then you can plant those. Um, and, and this is elephant garlic, which is actually a uh, spacing on the name, but um, elephant garlic also does this kind of habit of making these little escape pods, the, that little yellow thing in the top right of the frame. Elephant garlic is fun to grow. And if you find it in stores, and I mentioned potato or multiplier onions, these are old fashioned onions that grow in a shallot habit, meaning um, typically if you plant an onion, uh, an onion seed, you get that one um, onion bulb. And these you plant uh, like you plant garlic, one little onion, uh, on, multiplier onion bulb, and it starts to multiply out. So you get lobes and um, clusters the way that you do with shallots. Um, this is out in my garden. Um, excuse me, out in the forest. I just planted some out in the forest to see what would happen. They grow pretty well. An old fashioned variety. And you'll always see this is compost, right? Onions want to live. So that's the, what's called the chef's mustache, right? The bottom part of the onion, upside down, roots up, trying to grow uh, in my compost bin. You typically don't want to, for, for almost anything, potatoes, onions, you typically don't want to take something from the market and try and grow it. Reason being, the things that are in the market are often um, varieties specifically adapted to mechanized agriculture and row cropping and um, and they might not have pests and disease resistance or they might depend on a lot of things that you don't have in your garden. So you're going to want to source these not not from the market. Um, potatoes, for instance, have viruses and things that you just don't want. Um, so um, get yourself a good onion supplier. There's potatoes. Potatoes are one of these things that I don't grow every year. They take a lot of space for not a lot of yield. We talked about space for yield, um, but they're fun and fresh potatoes are great. And you can get varieties that might be difficult to otherwise get fingerling potatoes and purple potatoes, although anymore you can get those at, at fancier markets, but um, fresh potatoes are really delicious. They just take a lot of space. Uh, it's a lot of top growth. And then you're getting some small amount of, um, unless you're a potato expert, um, but you want to get certified seed potatoes. You want to hill up. So that means you plant it and you kind of, um, as it's growing, you're covering it with soil so that the it's got a lot of root space underneath to make these potatoes. Um, they don't want a bunch of nitrogen. They'll get hollow heart of the potato, meaning that the potatoes themselves will be kind of hollow in the middle and not great. 
Um, they don't, they hate being, um, they hate boom bust cycles of water. So just light frequent watering. Um, and then you can, and there's tons of ways people do like baskets and stacking baskets, stacking tires. There's lots of look up some ways that people grow potatoes because you can put them in the bottom and of a tire on the ground and fill that with soil and add another tire and add to, 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 as it's growing. And then you get this big tower of presumably tower of roots and you kick it over and it's full of potatoes. And I've done stuff like that. Um, I never get huge yields of potatoes to be quite honest, but, um, but it's fun to grow purple ones and it's run to, fun to grow um, varieties. Um, they make pretty flowers. How you, how you plant them, you get a potato like this in the mail or from a nursery, you cut it into chunks that have say two of those eyes per chunk and you let that dry out for a day or two so that the cut edges um, kind of get dried out. What you don't want is to put these in, in a cold soil and just have them rot immediately. So kind of let them dry a little bit and then you plant them out and, um, and let them grow. And then they look like that. And they look like that sometimes. This is a, a manatee, I think it's uh, yellow fin or something like that. One of these sort of fingerling or some kind of Russian fingerling potato that looked like a little manatee to me. Um, but I've grown all these varieties and, and I encourage you, and, and you'll find good catalogs that are just potatoes. There are a couple of suppliers um, that you can look for um, and search for that are just have specific potatoes. And you can choose them for lots of purposes. There's waxy potatoes. There's ones that are good for baking. Um, there are different colors and shapes. There's ones that are especially buttery, et cetera. Um, so I encourage you to uh, try potatoes and you don't have to devote a huge amount of space to them, but just know you're not going to get, um, you know, sack a 50 pound a bag after 50 pound bag of potatoes. Um, if you grow like some in just a little plot, um, but now let's talk about the kind of the meat of the matter. Why most folks, at least that I talk to in these classes, if I ask you, why do you garden or what, how do, why did you start gardening? Tomatoes is the number one answer. And, um, and that's true for me. My grandmother in Southern California grew tomatoes and that was kind of the origin of my um, gardening. And so we'll talk about the full, the full sun vegetables, the summer vegetables. These are peppers. I love to grow peppers and they're uh, extremely, usually knock on wood, let me knock on wood, uh, successful in my garden. Um, probably the most successful besides garlic uh, uh, year after year. Um, and I, I, tomatoes are good too, but, but I really like to grow peppers. So these are um, top left is Fresno and Habanero and then uh, over there on the right is probably Yatsu Fusa or Shishito, and then Jalapeno, and the middle is probably Thai Bird, and the bottom is Serrano, and on the left is Cayenne. So I grow them hot and I grow them sweet, and they're typically harvested right around the time school starts, so I typically bring a bunch in to the faculty workroom and, and present the Scoville scale, which is the, you know, the heat scale, and, and nitrile gloves for people can put them in bags and take them home and enjoy peppers, so I uh, really like peppers. The, full, the summer vegetables, the ones on the chart um, that are, you know, plant and seed and plant like now and sort of into May and then expect to harvest in, you know, July and into um, October, November, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, which are all uh, family members, and then squashes and melons and cucumbers and beans and corn. So let's talk about the, the venerable tomato. Um, that's, uh, what is that? Yellow, is yellow boy? Lemon boy, I believe. Um, so I, I typically grow like 30 or 50 tomato plants uh, of many, many, many varieties. I typically start a bunch from seed and then I fill in from the sad ones that are left over at the end of the season that are all leggy, leggy at the right aid. And I, you know, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for tomatoes and um kind of get nuts about grant planting tomatoes um tomatoes are big plants they make a, a except and i'll tell you a few varieties if you just have a containers or small things they like rich soil they put out huge root systems they're perennial where they are native right so in south america they're a perennial plant they just live all season long um, and you can actually overwinter tomatoes you can dig them up um, cut them, cut them to, you know, just leave a stem like that, put them in a pot, keep them warm in the garage or warm earth in the outside. 
and replant them next year. They can, you can keep them um, going year after year. And that gives you a jump on the season. If you want to get crazy about tomatoes, they like, they, they drink a lot because they're putting out huge amounts typically of foliage. Um, you'll want to rotate them through because they are subject to some pests and diseases um, that can build up in the soil. If you plant tomatoes um, every year in the same spot, this is uh, tigerella, which is ugh, don't, don't terrible tomato. Don't plant it. Um, not a good flavor, not a, a really weedy and just not great. Um, this is a funny, I think a funny picture because when you get it, once you, so let's say we started tomatoes from seed and they grow up and they, you got a nice nursery plant in your own nursery or windowsill, then you can plant them. Uh, you can pinch the leaves off of the lower nodes and plant them deep, right? Because everywhere that soil kind of touches where there was a leaf that you pinched, um, they'll start to root. So here you can see that example, this was a tomato seed planted in a peat pot. Um, you can see it on the right down there at the bottom and you can see a nice big fat earthworm at the first node where there would have been leaves that I pinched off and buried below the soil, right? So they, you can plant them deep and they'll make roots everywhere they're touching the soil. I'll talk about um, yield per space and growing up. This is how I do tomatoes. Everybody has a different way they do tomatoes. Uh, I wouldn't recommend the real flimsy tomato cages. They're not strong enough for most, uh, for a, a nice tomato. Although anymore, um, people are producing like much burlier tomato cages and those can be pretty good for, a, especially for determinate tomatoes like um, uh, Repeco and stuff. But I do it like this. I put in T-post and rebar and then I train the tomatoes up almost like a grape and I keep them pretty one dimension or you know keep them sort of espalier, if you will, like a grapevine tied to these and let them go up. And then I, <clears throat> uh, up to that first bar that I have is about a foot up and I keep, I strip all the leaves from that lower part and just leave one uh, central trunk, although I haven't done it here. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe I was gonna go do that and probably did that right after this photo and then tie them up. And by the time they get up the top, I stop, uh, I, I let them just bush out and branch out to give some shade to the fruit. Um, on the upper. People do them and make a round corral out of concrete reinforced, four inch concrete reinforcement wire or hog pen or um, there's, so there's any number of ways to get tomatoes, but you wanna kind of keep them up. And especially that's, especially for vining tomatoes. Um, determinate versus indeterminate is a word I used. Determinate tomatoes are often called bush tomatoes and they often set their fruit in one or sort of all at once. And the classic tomatoes in this category are canning tomatoes or paste tomatoes, right? So um, Repreco, Roma, um, and what happens is they'll set a bunch of flowers, they'll throw a bunch of flowers, you'll have a bunch of fruit that more or less all goes at the same time. These bush, they tend to be bush forms, um, these kind of determinate tomatoes. And that's really good if you want a bunch of tomatoes all at once for um, canning and stuff. So we're gonna do a class in a couple of weeks um, in partnership with the master food preservers, talking about tomatoes seed to table. So some of this will be review, but I'll talk a little bit more about tomatoes in that class um, and teaching that with some wonderful, uh, another wonderful org, the master food preservers in the county. And we have a couple, we're lucky to have a couple MGs that are MFPs. So we'll be co-teaching that class. Just indeterminate tomatoes are vining types and they have, um, so there's a bush type. You can see there's all those yellow flowers. They're all gonna flower at once. They're all gonna set tomatoes at once and they're all gonna ripen more or less at the same time. And that's a bushy tomato that is relatively, that's terribly supportive. Meant, right when I say don't use those kind of cages, there's one uh, in the photo. Um, but I probably just had it handy at that time. And then versus an indeterminate tomato, which is a vining type, which will have um, all stages of the fruit growth so there'll be flowers at the top, there'll be fruits ripening in the middle, there'll be green fruits on the bottom um, all across the season. So at a longer, over a longer period of time and at different stages. Um, and so, you know, you're gonna plant probably, I'd get some of each. It's nice to have a bunch of, a bunch of paste tomatoes for salsa all at once. And it's also nice to be able to pick tomatoes um, over a long period of time. And, you know, there's tomatoes that are big ruffled tomatoes and tomatoes, that's that one don't, that is, is gross tomato. I don't know, I don't like it. I don't, don't, don't grow it, tigerella. Um, but anymore, I really like to grow um, small, on the small end of tomatoes, just because um, it fits my lifestyle. <laughs> uh, 
um, I don't have children at home anymore. And so um, tomatoes are mostly salad things and salsa things. And cherry tomatoes are great uh, because they, they, they produce a lot of fruit, but it's not overwhelming, right? So that right there, there's, you know, two tomatoes that are edible and two will be ready in three days and you'll have a, cluster, a couple of clusters. Um, tomatoes come in all, all colors and all different purposes. Um, there's, that's a sort of a one day tomato harvest of, of a bunch of pear, uh, pear tomato teardrop or whatever pears, uh, red pear tomatoes probably with a couple of other things sprinkled in. Uh, problems of tomatoes, this is blossom end rot. Um, you'll see all kinds of folk remedies for this. Oh, spray milk on them or, or et cetera. What this has to do, it's like a, a, an unusual interaction between rapidly growing tissues and calcium and the plant's inability to move water in different places. Here's the, the bottom line for this for me. You might want to, if, if you have this problem consistently, you might want to try and work some oyster shell or something into the soil for the next season. You're not going to solve it this season. And in my garden, almost invariably, the first couple of fruits have this problem. And then the plant, I don't know, figures its thing out. And then thereafter, you don't have blossom end rot, or at least I don't. You can cut that bad part off and still eat that tomato. So it's not typically a... Um, it isn't something I worry about anymore. I just keep my soil, I add compost, I keep my soils um, active and add things to them and just accept the minor damage of blossom end rot that happens. Um, and if you find a variety, let's say you plant a seed and it does this like a lot and it ruins a lot of the crop, you might just decide that's not the tomato for your garden and pick a different one. Um, happens all the time in plum tomatoes for me too. Not all the time, again, that first kind of a couple plant fruits in that first flush and then not an issue if they if they flush again. And then of course these. <laughs> um, and the only way to deal with hornworms is to go pick them off really. Um, and they'll do, they're hard to, they're hard to see. They're really well camouflaged. So a technique is go out in the garden in the morning when it's quiet and you can hear them chewing and you'll see they will have stripped some uh, branch and you can kind of sort of trace it back and you can find their droppings um, and then you can hand pick those and feed them to the Jays. Um, leave them out on a sacrificial platform like the goat in Jurassic Park and let the Jays come get them. Um, and they'll go, actually, they'll actually this, is a, this is one on a pepper. They'll go to pepper too, but they, they seem to really want, um, they seem to really want tomatoes. The folks in my family, once one of these is spotted, they'll never go out and pick tomatoes again. They, that's it for them, so try to keep them in check. Tomatoes though are just such a wonderful, uh, there are just so many varieties, especially if you get into some of the deeper seed catalogs, Seed Savers Exchange or some of the tomato specific ones. Um, these are just some varieties that I plant um, pretty often. Um, um, Oaxacan pink is a, a fussy tomato, but really neat. It's a, a neat sort of dark pinkish color. Very, um, it's roughly, and it, it sort of wraps itself around its stem. So it's kind of hard to process. You get to end up with a lot of waste when you're cutting that stuff out. Um, but it, uh, fun, bull's heart, kind of a big, um, a big meaty tomato. Um, Repeco, Amish paste, peace fine cherry, black creme, which is a nice dark color and a salty kind of tomato. And then these last two, if you are doing container gardening or uh, balcony gardening, you might choose to look for a plant. Kootenai and red um, house freestanding are small stocky tomato plants that can hold themselves up so they have a bush form. Um, they're not gonna produce you know, pounds and pounds and pounds and pounds of fruit, but you can be successful looking for, you know, ideal for containers on the, on the label or the seed packet or small. Um, so kind of go that way um, as, you're, as you're treading into tomato territory. That's just the thing you'll see advertised. Uh, tomatoes and potatoes and peppers and those things are um, plants um, that are related. And so there's these grafted, <laughs> grafting experiments that you can do to put tomato bottoms on tomato, uh, tomato tops on potato bottoms and those kinds of things. That's just kind of a fun photo. And then if you're into salsas and um, uh, Mexican and South American cooking, you might want to look into tomatillo which are these husk tomatoes, um, really prolific, really, if you let even one of those go in your garden, you'll have them for years. They're not super invasive, but you'll, the seeds will, you'll have them forever. Um, 
uh, until you weed them all out. So don't don't worry about it. It's not going to take over your garden, but just know that if you <laughs> leave any of those seeds from a fruit in the garden, they're cool though because they'll fall off when they're ready and they're they're in their own paper wrapper. So um, and those come in green and purple varieties. Uh, I'm not going to mention that. This is a garden huckleberry, which is in the same family and uh, not worth growing, but uh, I grew it to try it. You're supposed to be able to make pies out of these, but you'd have to put some, it'd just be a sugar pie with bland um, tomato like. Yeah, don't even worry about it. Um, but again, tomatoes are pretty diehard. Uh, give them enough water, give them some space, they will probably take over your garden. You can prune them sort of endlessly. Problems that uh, spider mites can be a problem of tomatoes, especially late season, which is why I keep the, the leaves off the ground and train them up, right? It's fewer vectors for the spider mites to get up into the plant. They'd have to climb the main stem. Um, and so it's sort of easier to keep, keep control over them. Peppers come in like sweet and hot varieties. Sweet ones aren't necessarily sweet. They're just not hot. So bell pepper is a sweet pepper. There's a nice bell pepper. Um, peppers in particular, like hot varieties and small varieties and desert peppers and stuff are really slow to germinate. So and, uh, on the order of like multiple years in some cases. So just know that um, that that's not true for regular or sort of more common varieties like jalapeno and those kinds of things. So don't worry about it, but they do tend to germinate a little slower and some of them really germinate slower. Um, they like to germinate in warm soils. They are uh, sort of a full sun plant, but they really actually love a little afternoon shade. That they don't, they're not as rugged. They're a fleshier and not as rugged plant as a tomato. And so um, what I like to do is grow tomatoes tall. And then on the, on the, uh, the post noon, af hot afternoon um, period, uh, I plant them on this side of the tomato so that the this, this tomato, tall tomato plants are providing a little afternoon shade for the peppers. That's how I plant them. Um, together just because they seem to be a little happier. And they they a big pepper plant needs support too. They will blow over quite a bit. They'll keep growing usually. They'll fall over and just sort of keep growing up. But um, those little flimsy tomato cages, if you happen to have some of those around, those are pretty good for peppers, especially bell peppers and in, um, in that kind of branch of the pepper family tree. Um, they hate to be dried out and and they get top heavy when they're covered in fruit, right? So um, provide them some support, string them up to your tomato um, trellis, which is what I often do, or give them like a little cage. There's a, you know, a nice one day pepper harvest. Uh, I, my, the bell peppers when I grow them are never, so if you're accustomed to getting them in the market, they have really like thick, cell, uh, thick pepper walls. I've never been able to grow ones um, that are like that. And that could be that the varieties that are better for home gardens just don't do that. And it could be that they just don't do that in my garden. They taste like bell peppers. They're just not that kind of really thick, um, thick wall pepper. But here's a whole bunch. And in the middle here are some of those uh, little um, pickling peppers, little round ones that are kind of sweet and a bunch of hot ones uh, ready for a stir fry. There's a beautiful bell pepper from my garden and a yellow bell pepper from my garden. A lot of peppers will, um, there's a, ooh, that's corny de toro or something like that. Um, and again, I pickle peppers, I dry them, I use them in Asian dishes and in salsas. That's um, Anaheim, which is not very hot, but a classic stuffing pepper. Um, there's a red Anaheim having, a lot of peppers will start out green and go red if you let them. Um, and then some you buy specifically to be red or orange or yellow. Um, but they almost all start out, start out green and they turn whatever color they're going to turn as they mature. And they tend to, in my, to my palate, the green ones, the red ones tend to have a tangier, more citrusy, I would say, or tangier um, flavor profile. So there's, it's sometimes fun to mix in some red ones. These are just a lot of images of peppers from my garden. And some you buy, uh, you grow specifically to dry. Um, so you can dry them out. There's an example of them starting out green and then going red from the stem side, which is kind of neat. You can eat them green too. They're just better. Uh, in, in this particular variety is, uh, is that um, cayenne? Looks like cayenne maybe. Some of them grow up. Very often little tiny peppers like this are really hot. Uh, Thai bird and um, some like Sonoran desert peppers and those kinds of things. Um, just a really pretty plant. In the lower right-hand corner here, you might see a buried water bottle. Um, 
Sometimes I do that. So at the time of planting, I'll take a one gallon juice jug, poke a little hole in it uh, in the bottom and in the cap and fill it with water. And as the plant grows, it's um, I keep that uh, as a water reservoir, especially if I'm gonna be gone. Um, and so they can kind of, and that often they'll send roots into that and fill it up with roots and have, uh, have a kind of deep water source. And you can buy those as clay pots too, right? That you can bury and um, so something fun to try. They don't necessarily need it. And especially if you have a good drip system, you're not gonna worry about it, but it's a beautiful purple pepper. That's the hot one. And uh, so habanero, not and not the hottest, by the way, Scotch bonnets and other ones, um, bullet peppers and those things. You can, if you get into hot peppers, you can find whole catalogs of just hot peppers. Um, the hottest one I typically grow usually is habanero. And it's a different kind of hot. It's got that interesting fruity hot, um, but very late in the season. Like sometimes these are still, it's November before they're, they're ready. And I, they freeze really well. You don't need a lot of this pepper, right? So <laughs> in any particular dish, so. They freeze really well. You can cut them in half and just kind of poach them in oil and then freeze that um, or use it in uh, cornbread. Habanero cornbread is like really good. But um, not super prolific in my garden. That's probably the sum total of that year's harvest, which is fine. That's a lot of freeze those and you got them for, for a lot of dishes for a lot of a lot of time. There's just some varieties to try ones that I've done, some Asian, some uh, Mexican and South American. and. Um, so if you're looking for some names of peppers, there's some to try. And at a couple of years ago, someone started producing six packs where there were six different peppers in one six pack, which I think is a brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So if your nursery has that, that's a great way. And they do it with tomatoes too. That seems like a new thing, like within the last five years, at least in the nurseries that I frequent, really great way to just get a bunch of pepper, different kinds, and then see, well, these ones grow well, or these ones we like to eat, and these ones I would skip. And then you can kind of narrow it down without having to start you know six different kinds of seeds or buy six packs of six different kinds of peppers and they'll often be cool like a, a jalapeno a serrano an anaheim uh, and sometimes a mix of sweet and hot and so um, you can look for a six pack if you're trying to branch out uh, eggplant in the same um, <laughs> genre um, you'll see when you plant seeds or or when you buy seed packets or when you when you get um uh plants that are already made, VF, verticillium and fusarium wilt, um, which are problems of these plants and they go to other plants as well, tomatoes. And um, so if you know you have those problems then you can look for VF, um, there's also tobacco mosaic virus and some other things, but that's what that means when you say VF resistance, verticillium and fusarium resistant. Eggplant can be brittle and want some caging. I have plant only few is a, a I don't like eggplant, so that's why that's there. They're pretty prolific. So if you're an eggplant fan, plant a lot. And if you just want a few um, to satisfy other members of your family and you're not gonna eat them, then know that they're a pretty prolific plant. They are very, um, they're very fussy about cold. So they're like the last thing you plant out. Um, and so you don't wanna put them out. They're, they're gonna go out later than all the other members of their family, chilies and, and tomatoes, are gonna wait a, a pretty long time because they just really, if they start out cold, they just, they seem to never get get on their roots or it takes them a long time. But they come in cool, you know, the classic, this is a uh, Ichiban, probably a, a Japanese one. And then, you know, they come in sort of that shape and white and purple. And then they, they are also, I guess I don't have some of the, they come in little round, um, round shapes and very small ones. And so there's, it's an interesting family of plants to kind of explore. Squash is a real diehard and relatively easy plant to grow in the garden. Um, and, and don't overplant there too, right? You might, you might need a, some total of like two squash plants or two hills, so four total plants, and you're gonna be drowning in squash and sick of it by the end of the season, or you can shred it and freeze it. It does that really well so that you have um, squash breads that you can make throughout the year or things to add to winter soups. Um, specifically squash, I'm mostly talking about summer squashes, which are squashes that don't have a hard shell. Although you can you can look for other squashes that are keeping squashes or um, winter squashes, which don't mean they grow in the winter. They grow in the summer, but they have a hard shell so they keep into the winter, right? So um, insects are a big player. So you'll see the flowers of bees and you want to make sure that bees are around to get into their um, this is something you typically would just, or at least I do, typically just direct seed it 
uh, into a hill in, what does the chart say about squash? Yeah, direct seeding like in May to June. Um, so I, I do whatever, two hills, plant three seeds in two hills, let two of them live and, uh, and they grow up next to each other. And um, pick off and what that means is if, if you, and you'll always forget to get one and it'll hide and it'll be, it'll turn like a zucchini and it'll get this big. And um, the plant, if you think about what it's trying to do, it's trying to make seeds, right? It's trying to reproduce. And so if you steal its fruit all the time, regularly, it, um, it, it's going to keep trying to make fruit. And if you let it kind of make fruit and you miss and you don't pick them off and they will slow down um, the job of making new fruit. So you just want to pick them uh, and pick them small. They're better when they're small and tender anyway. So just sort of go out there and pick a bunch and um, keep them picked to keep them productive. It's true for pretty much anything um, that we've been talking about. Um, and, you know, I like actually squash is all right. I don't know. I'm not a huge fan, but I like patty pan squash. And so um, you can get the zucchini styles in yellow and green. You can get patty pan styles. You can get um, red curry squash. I had real good luck with this red curry squash um, from a local seed supplier um, that that kind of, um, this is a really good variety for our particular, our, when I say our, El Dorado County. Um, so um, a nice orange flesh squash. But squash are pretty easy to grow and they're very prolific. And the problem of squash, that's what you want, right? You want bees in there um, on the female flowers. And you can tell the female flowers from the male flowers. Um, the male flowers are usually on longer stalks and they have um, uh, a little paintbrushy thing and you can hand pollinate or let the bees do it. Um, problems of squash um, fungus, uh, powdery mildew, excuse me, is the, the big problem. So late in the season, the leaves will get covered in white fuzzy stuff. Um, they squash, in my opinion, squash grows so well and so fast that if a late season um, powdery mildew, I'll either just cut that plant out and throw it away and plant another one, or you know, by the time it's that, you can try and fight it with sulfur and keeping the you know, moistening the leaves and different things. But um, honestly, you're probably gonna be sick of squash by that time anyway. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. And they don't, they don't have too many other problems in my experience. And then you can grow pumpkins, right? Here's another one where th that, these is a 96 and 102 pound pumpkin that I grew. I don't grow competitive pumpkin growing, but I thought it would be fun to do this one year. But that's a vine, that's like a 20 foot vine thin to one fruit. So it's a huge amount of uh, real estate. So um, I don't grow big pumpkins, but I do grow um, snackjack and kakai hullless, which are, are uh, much more like that size. And then they have hullless seeds, meaning you can just cut it open and toast the seeds and they're more like sunflower seeds than they are like pumpkin seeds because they don't have that hard outer shell. So you can just eat them um, without having to either chew through that hard shell or spit it out. So um, the, anymore, that's what I grow when I grow pumpkin. And then if you want to grow them giant, go look up giant pumpkin growing. You got to shade them and you know grow them on a pallet so you can move them with a forklift and um, there are some master gardeners that are really into that um, in our county. So call the master gardener office and say, who's into giant pumpkin growing? They share seeds and they write numbers on them and it's a whole thing. That's just a cool picture of seeds inside a pumpkin germinating inside a pumpkin. So when I cracked that one open, there were already seeds that were germinating and trying to grow inside the pumpkin. And if, if you leave them like in a, if you leave a pumpkin out in the woods, they'll do that. But there's a hullless pumpkin seed. So you can just toast that and eat it right there. And it's just delicious and really good for you. I think pumpkin seeds are really good. There they are toasted. So cantaloupe and, and other kinds of melons. Um, again, like squash, bees are the thing. They really want to either be started in a warm uh, greenhouse or late in the season when the soils have warmed up. You can harvest by smell for things like cantaloupe. Like if you go up and sniff the sniff that, you'll know if it smells like a nice cantaloupe, it's probably ready. Or if you sort of slightly move it and it'll slip from the vine. Um, there are other techniques of looking for the first tendril, in the case of a watermelon, away from it being withered and stuff. Some of that's just experience. Like you might harvest it a little too early or a little too late. Um, and when I grow these again, it's this idea of space versus whatever. Vine, uh, melon vines are huge or can be huge. So I like to grow little things. This is a, a snake skin, a bush snake skin, um, watermelon. 
Um, so I, I turned to the little sugar babies and crimson sweets and early moonbeams, little yellow flesh, uh, watermelons, and uh, moon and stars are just kind of fun. That's the dark green one with sort of one big cream colored splotch as the moon and a few little cream colored splotches as the star. But again, the, con the thing there, if you can grow them up, you, you can grow them up a trellis, but they need you need to support the fruit. So you see people do this with, um, with pantyhose or with nets in that previous slide, um, you know, make some little sling for it um, and keep it up off the ground. And the benefit also there is that the leaves aren't getting wet and getting diseases and um, pests aren't kind of climbing in and chewing them up. Um, so growing them up. Cucumbers. <clears throat> There's a lovely little cucumber. Uh, again, they don't like their, they have kind of weak roots and so you don't want to disturb them. And so I like to plant them direct. So direct seed them into their spot, train them up to keep the leaves up off the ground. And then they really hate to be in cool shaded conditions, except if you can find the rare instance where their roots are cool and their tops are hot, um, uh, that's like a really ideal, it's kind of, can be hard to do, but like I had one situation where the, I sort of planted them right at the edge of a shade so that, and, and under compost and then trained them out into the sun. And that was the best that I ever had cucumber. And that's really hard, but they really don't like, um, they really hate inconsistent watering. Right, so evenly moist, don't boom and bust them. The, they'll not fruit right, the fruit won't taste good. Um, and so they really want consistent um, watering. And then cool and shady also, they get some uh, leaf, like leaf fungus kinds of things too. So, uh, but again, you can choose those for uh, pickling ones or ones that are um, good for sweet ones for slicing into salads. Uh, lemon, which is a classic um, round um, and fun for kind of a fresh salad and then, um, other long varieties. There's a, um, don't know, can't remember what variety that is, but it's a nice sort of pickling pickle variety. That's an Armenian cucumber that is probably too long and I skipped or lost it. And so it's probably not good. So that one goes to the chickens, um, but they come in some fun forms and you can kind of choose them. And then a couple seasons back, I got um, seeds for Mexican sour gherkins, which are fun little um, cucurbits that are tangy, um, super prolific, like crazy prolific. And you can, uh, fun to pickle. You just sort of prick each one with a toothpick and lacto fermentum or, or go through other pickling processes. I don't can, so I do fresh lacto or lacto fermentation stuff, but, um, kind of a fun, um, a fun pickle, very, um, invasive, not invasive, but like it goes all over the place, lots and lots of vines. So just be aware that um, a good cucumber can take over a lot of real estate. Um, and then beans. So the cool season legume, we talked about legumes in the beginning. The cool season legume is a pea, but the warm season legume is a bean. There's a bean emerging from the soil. Um, beans plant after danger of frosts. Beans are big seeds, right? And big seeded things, and the kind of general rule is thumb is big seeded, seeded things you plant deep and skinny seeded, or little seeded things you plant shallowly. So plant after danger of frost for beans because if you pop a bean into cold soil, it's likely to, uh, cold wet soil, it's likely to rot before it has a chance to kind of get get going. Um, the, the term here is so to moisture, meaning when I go to plant beans, I soak the soil and plant the beans and then don't water again until the beans have popped up because that way you know they're not gonna just get soaked and um, rot in place. So give it so a good soaking, pop the beans in, a week later or less, they will pop up. And plant in succession means, you know, you can plant some beans now and two weeks later plant some more and two weeks later plant some more so that you have an extended um, harvest over time. You'll see them in pole and bush types, even sometimes the same bean, it will be the blue lake is an example. You can get blue lake pole and blue lake bush. Pole beans tend to produce more over time, but require, um, they can be a big, big burly plant. So requires some staking and trellising. And bush types also require usually some staking and trellising because otherwise they just fall over. The main problem with beans in my garden is spider mites. And so you'll know that you have spider mites because if you look, you'll see the spider mites or you'll flip over the, the leaves, especially it starts low, spider mites come in and move up the plant. Um, there'll be like weird webbing and little dots and the leaves will start to look a little silver. 
Um, and so you really got to get on that um, because it'll take over and really rob the plant of its vigor pretty quickly. Um, and so there's uh, insecticidal soap will take care of spider mites. Um, picking the leaves and just bagging them up or putting them in the burn pile or putting them away to put in the burn pile for next season. Um, but really keep on that because um, because they can get a hand quickly. Um, there's beans, you've all seen them. And then you can explore things like this is a scarlet runner bean. So these are flat potted um, uh, Italian beans that grow a beautiful flower, right? And a much smaller plant. Um, there's a pup, oh, she has since passed, but that puppy is in the corn. So beans and corn are often talked about in the same sentence. And I talked about following corn with beans. Here's corn. And I only plant corn, honestly, every like four years or something. It just takes a huge amount of space uh, because corn is, is largely wind pollinated. So you need blocks of like six feet by six feet uh, minimum to kind of get a real good um, uh, fruit, uh, corn. What happens is um, the corn plants will go up. At the top will be the male flower that sheds pollen, which cascades down. And then at every everywhere there are tassels, the silks um, along the stalk will catch that pollen, and that makes your your ears of corn. Um, so it's best planted in blocks and not rows. Um, you, I, it makes me sad sometimes to see when people go and buy a six pack of corn and plant six corns in a row. You're probably not going to get very good uh, things. So you need to reserve kind of a block for some corn. And then you can plant it in succession also. Um, it's fun to grow, uh, but it's a it's a hog and it, it takes a lot of uh, water and a lot of nitrogen, which is why then you would probably plant beans or plant beans alongside it. There's a, and, uh, there's a, you can plant beans and have them climb up the corn. So they're simultaneously kind of balancing out the soil with nitrogen while the corn is uh, stealing it from this or borrowing it from the soil. Um, You'll see varieties that are early, mid, and late season. Um, you want to pick it quick and put it in the water quick so that it doesn't get starchy. Um, and you can go out and pierce a, pierce a kernel with your thumb and see if it's sweet. And um, so you'll see corn in all different varieties. The, there's like the super sweet kinds, but, but if, I, if you've never grown corn, get a six by six block and plant something like Silver Queen or things in a more old fashioned corns, triple play. Um, the, there's sort of an arms race to make sweet corn, corn, but you're going to maybe have, uh, unless you're, you're sure about how you're growing it, you're going to have better um, success with some more old fashioned corns. Silver Queen is a good one. We're not talking about perennials other than get, think about where you're going to put them when they become available again. They're probably available right now. I actually haven't been out to nursery in a long time, but this is the season when you would normally get asparagus, um, artichoke rhubarb and those kinds of things. So we're going to skip that and talk about that in fall and winter vegetables. Um, and here are some resources and we, the, the MG website, the UC IPM, IPM integrated pest management with the pest notes, right? So if you have a problem, you can go look that up like aphids or ground squirrels. They have a, a pest note for all of those things. And you can look at what controls are available. The VRIC, which is the great, it has the one sheet uh, handout on, to, on potatoes for the home gardener. And you can just kind of get a refresher on all this information um, and kind of download the VRIC or look, research that stuff. Um, and we can repost these. I'm going to bomb through them, but we can put them back up or put them in the chat. Um, plant a row for the hungry. And uh, I personally document my garden, although I haven't uh, documented in a while, but if you're interested in food forest, just a labor of love, non-commercial, and having nothing to do with money, um, food forest garden is where I have talked about my garden in the past. I mentioned the plant sales, and so did Tracy. We've got the two coming up. Um, I think we can take credit cards now, but we prefer cash and check. Is that true? Um, yes, Visa and MasterCard. Visa and MasterCard. Um, and the, this is labor of love on the behalf of, but these are all the, all the, all of my heroes in the county, my hero gardeners, the master gardeners are the folks planting and, and doing all the work we just talked about seeding and, um, and getting plants ready for you. And because those emerge from this county, then they're going to be more likely to be varieties that master gardeners like, know, and love. And so you're really, um, and it, and the other thing that does is it helps us to fund in particular, um, 
our programs, um, not the least of which is the beautiful Sherwood Demonstration Garden up behind the County Office of Ed and El Dorado Center. Um, uh, so go go visit that uh, when it has open uh, tour hours and go look at the beautiful gardens, vegetable garden, um, shade gardens, et cetera, et cetera, butterfly garden, children's garden, all kinds of wonderful garden, just an absolute gem. Um, that This is a, a image from uh, one of our quad hoppers that we fly at the college. And that concludes, that's it.